Hi folks, welcome to the latest edition of Serverless Crack. Um, with myself, Dave Anderson, I'm an author and contributor to Serverless Age and a technical fellow at Bizarre Voice. Mark McCann, uh, author and contributor at Serverless Age and uh, architect at Globalization Partners. Michael O'Reilly, a contributor with the Serverless Edge and a architect at Globalization Partners. There we go, all sorted. Hello. So today we're going, to get, we're going to continue our conversation about the uh, well architected pillars and our what is our favorite pillar chat. And today we're going to talk about sustainability. We've actually talked quite a lot about sustainability. It's a new pillar that was added just in reInvent there at the end of uh, 2021. So we've talked about it a fair amount, number one, because it's new and it's kind of exciting. And two, I think, because we've been following this for the past probably two years and it's a, yeah. it's a brilliant addition. And um, what's nice about sustainability is it, it rolls up a lot of really good practices. And it's a very simple measure. So it's um, very hard to measure carbon, but very simple to understand when someone decade or less measures it for you. Yeah. So um, this pillar is slightly different. It doesn't have all the same kind of questions. Uh, maybe they might change it eventually, but it's more like a, it's a list of best practices that are broken down in the, a couple of kind of um, um, sections. So it's, uh, I'll just list them out. It's region selection, user behavior patterns, software and architecture patterns, data patterns, hardware patterns, and development and deployment process. So it's kind of, it's a, a bunch of questions within those. So let's just fly through them. Um, region selection, that's that's quite straightforward. Any comments on that one? Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of this is some of the regions are um, supplied with green greener uh, energy than others. Um, some of them have um, regions that are you know using some non-sustainable for resources, um, depending on where you are in the world. So. If you don't have massive latency requirements or um, a real need for to you know, super fast low latency, then you're probably best putting it into a, a more sustainable region. So uh, I think uh, US one in Ireland is a sustainable region. There's a few others uh, across the AWS ecosystem. Google and Azure have have the same. So you know where you put your workloads can have a sustainability um, impact. So all all other things being equal, go for the greener one. Go for the more sustainable region for your workload. Yeah, and, and there's some regions that are not as sustainable and some that are very sustainable. There's a nice phrase that uh, Werner Vogels used during the launch that Adrian Cockcroft also uses. And it's kind of like um, the cloud providers, the cloud providers look after the sustainability of the cloud. They'll make the data centers as sustainable as possible. It's our responsibility to look after sustainability in the cloud. So they'll have a sustainable data center we have to design sustainable workloads. So I thought that was a nice kind of split and definitely region selection. If they say a certain region is green, you should try and put workload there. Yeah. And I think um, even beyond that, you know, the move to the cloud, you know, if you were running your own data center, you're going to have a hard time trying to be as sustainable or as green as what the cloud providers are doing because they're investing hundreds of millions, billions probably across the, across the yeah. globe to, to sustainably power and... and uh, cool and uh, provide all the sort of resources they need for their the, for the data centers yeah that, yeah exactly that's just going to say like that's kind of what's come through my head as you we were talking about that's that shared responsibility model and i think a lot of what the white paper gets into in that pillar is you know really understanding the separation of responsibility and you know probably good to kind of touch upon that as we kind of run down yeah. through it but that's a major one in terms of thinking you know the fact that the cloud are going to keep their side of it as green as possible. Um, but yeah. again, just coaching you in terms of the architect or the business owner around how to make good decisions in relation to what you're doing in your space uh, in terms of what you're building on the cloud with regards, uh, you know, sustainable approaches. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is this is the whole premi prem premise of the cloud is that the fact that an organization like Amazon or Microsoft or Google, they will do data centers better than you. Mm -hmm. So if you talk about user behavior patterns, you know, if you use their assets in an elastic way using the latest technology, it will be more sustainable, efficient, and cheaper. 
you know, if, if modern cloud, if you if you if you go down the legacy cloud route and treat like the cloud, the public cloud, like a data center, then you're not going to be very sustainable. Yeah. You're not going to be very cheap, and you're not going to be very efficient. So it's that yeah. el- elasticity thing that I don't know. It, it was popular like ten years ago when the cloud kind of started, but people seem to have forgotten about it. Yeah, and I think you know under under the user behavior pattern sort of uh, section, I guess. Yeah. You know, how do you align your SLAs with your sustainability goals? Uh, screams out to me, especially with sort of the COP26 with boardroom level mandates and, you know, these sort of uh, concerns are going to be more more uh, prevalent and more and more uh, visible to all teams and on all the way up and down the, 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 the hierarchy, I guess. Um, so you're going to be asked about how green is your solution? How green is your product? How green is your business? Um, so, you know, making sure that our workloads are, are our solutions that we put into the cloud, you know, at least are aligned to those, those, those SLAs will be, will be something that we're all going to be concerned with over the next number of, number of years, I think. Mm-hmm. It's no different when you, when you buy like a soft drink, you've got, you know, sustainable packaging. That's a big mm-hmm. thing. In the future, you use a digital service. You want to use sustainable, you know, um, packaging, which is effectively the cloud. Yeah. So the next, the next area is software and architecture patterns. Um, I think this one is interesting. It's a lot about kind of um, just keeping your code base and your architecture really efficient and like refactoring, optimization, and, um, you know, more effective data access. Yeah. yeah, and I think good good practice as well. You know, it t- ties back into sort of efficient kind of designs and, um, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but like when you kind of work in enterprise spaces, you do question the value that a lot of the maybe say the older kind of business products or things there that are just running in the background. And, you know, you got to be constantly assessing, is this, is this worth the, is this worth the the compute? Is this worth the, you know, the cycle times, you know, is this, um, are we really getting um, value for money for it? But also now you've got to factor sustainability into that. You know what I mean? So is it racking yeah. up your your carbon footprint? Okay, actually, then that's another factor. We should we should invest a bit of time in reducing, say, the amount of maintenance we're doing on something, or you know how efficient yeah. or inefficient something's running. Yeah. So I think this is definitely an interesting kind of area for a lot of people who are maybe working in sort of large, you know, organizations or spaces where they're they're having to support lots of different apps and different workloads. Yeah. Yeah, there's an interesting question there about uh, optimized impact on customer devices and equipment. So if you have a really inefficient client side app that has a load of, load of uh, yeah. processing that's doing on the device that doesn't need to be done, you, know, you could maybe maintain or sustain the lifetime of that device by years by having a more effective, efficient um, you know, client side app or web app or mobile app, whatever it is, right? So there's, there's yeah, lots of it's- things we can concern ourselves with here. And the thing is, if you're in a mobile app, like, do you need to send the, the biggest image possible over the network and, you know, make the device optimize it? Or can you optimize it ahead of time? There's a whole bunch of stuff around yeah. that and not being as fast as you need to be. There's another yeah. thing about architecture that in the olden days, there were constraints. So you had to do a proper architecture. I, I would imagine now there's some modern apps that people just, you've got like, you know, massive amount of scale. So as things scale, the architecture is not ready for it. Yeah. And you're relying on the network. So it's it's yeah. you've got modern mm-hmm. technology, but not optimized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you know the question here around you, know, how do you use software patterns and architectures that best support data access and storage patterns? If you're following yeah. a serverless first approach, you're well on the road to being sustainable. You're you're mm-hmm. you're a long yeah. way down that path. I mean, I, yeah. I do love that point about like kind of bad designs and sort of have an impact on sort of users you know and, and their devices and the fact that they could be using unsustainable kind of resources to you know charge their machines or charge their their phones and another one i always think about is like ides and you know, yep. look at some of the the bigger ides in terms of you know auto completion and indexing and things like that they they get very warm very quick yeah. and you're thinking well you're seeing a lot of like IDEs kind of moving into the cloud as well, you yep. know, cloud nine, that sort of stuff and others as well, you know, VS code and, and you're thinking, well, actually yeah. a lot of that should be done in the cloud too. And, yeah. and even you're seeing that, you're seeing that now in the UK where energy prices are going through the roof. Like I don't yeah. know what you use, mine's doubled in the last month. Um, 
Yeah. So if I can do anything to reduce that, that helps me as well. You know, I, so. I wonder. I wonder is it full circle? Like I, I, I'm old enough to remember the the olden days when um, CPU memory disk network was all limited. So you had to design the take into consideration, you know, mm. yeah. per per resources like that. Um, but it's it's going back to that way again, where you should be thinking of them as limited resources, so you're not using what you don't need. So yeah. it's interesting. It's getting, very, it's getting very much a very thin sort of client for all your needs, and everything is done in the cloud server side, yeah. right? Um, from your IDE yeah. to to everything else. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. So the next next one now is data patterns. So again, it's it's I mean it's it's a huge one. There's an awful lot of yeah. waste with data flying on the internet. Huge. Um, mental. Again, with quote Adrian Cockcroft, is a great saying. He says, "If you collect a piece of data and don't put it directly into a model, you should just delete it <laughs> because you don't need it." Um, which is a bit uh, extreme, but yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a it's a great idea. Um, yeah, and I think there's a lot of just good practice here about you know data can be quite toxic for for various reasons, from privacy and you know, breaches and security yeah. sort of point of view. So. You know, you should have a good handle on this, and your data classification yeah. is, is critical. And if you don't extract value from it, get rid of it, for it's just going to be unsustainable. Yeah, and this is kind of what yeah. I'm interested in. I'd love to learn a wee bit more around and, and dig into and, and and just see how it unfolds. Because, you know, we we are becoming everything's becoming more and more data centric, and the amount yeah. of compute that kind of goes in, they're just chomping through data is probably you know what 90 percent of what it is you'd love to see how much of the actual you know um you know electricity and is, is or energy usage is yeah. used in just processing data um yeah. and I, i'd be keen to see how you yeah. know organizations approach this one yeah, um, i think, the, uh, I think the, how, how do you minimize data movement across networks that's huge right only move what you need for when you need it Right, not yeah. just move everything for the crack. Yeah, Absolutely. you wonder will they start? I mean, they've egress charges when you're going out of the cloud. Wonder will they start doing more mm -hmm. of that? But that, that's a yeah. big one. So the next one is hardware patterns, which is about you know just about sizing your stuff correctly. I mean, we've all been in teams where it's like, what size of box do you need? And you're like the biggest one, the yeah. biggest one humanly possible. <laughs> so it's, that's just a um, that's yeah. reaction, but you don't need that. And again, this is where the serverless first sort of mindset and approach really kicks in the gear here. You know, you, you don't need to even concern yourself with a lot of these uh, questions. It's like, yep, that'll just automatically scale up and down uh, appropriately. Um, we're not having to worry about picking picking hardware or uh, or you know uh, instance sizes ahead of time. Yeah, or even a good one is the Lambda Power Tuner, where it will help yep. you um, pick the optimum hardware size. And sometimes it's it's not the biggest, it's the most yep. efficient. And then you know, um, with the gra the graviton chips coming in, right? Yeah. You know, immediately, you can be on a more sustainable um, compute platform without having to do too much else. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Very good. And then the last one for the sustainable pillar is development and deployment process. Um, yeah, this is a monster. <laughs> How do you increase utilization of build environments? Build everything yes. all the time. <laughs> Yes, yeah. uh, and this is this is you know, we see this quite a lot where environments sprawl and uh, assets sprawl for for no uh, real benefit. So again, it's all about being smart about you know how you set up your accounts, how you set up your pipelines, how you set up your environments to make sure they're actually delivering value and they're not just there to because that's the way we always did it, right? And people people running huge test suites that go on for days. And publishing results and no one ever looks at them. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, there's a question here about how, how do you adopt methods that can rapidly reduce or introduce sustainability improvements? Again, this is if you're on that server spectrum and the cloud providers are you know, working pretty much for you and they're introducing new capabilities. Mm -hmm. And you know, Graviton's a great example of this, right? It's, it's lower cost, it's, it's more powerful, it's, it's better performing, but it's also more sustainable. You know, if you're on a serverless sort of way of delivering your solution, you can just take advantage of that pretty much instantaneously, right? You're not having to do much work to do do so. Yeah, yeah. very good. 
and that's it. And you want to kind of make sure your your design and your architectures um, can move with those sorts of innovations. I think that's a large part of the spur of that. You know, you're seeing a lot of that, like Graviton, the M1, you know, different chipsets and, yeah. you know, and just the, the shift towards it and making sure you're getting advantage of that. So. Very good. Yeah. So that's the sustainability pillar. Now. That's the crack. So um, next time we'll be looking at all six pillars to see which one we like the best. So uh, thanks for listening and you can hear more on the or see more on the serverlessedge.com blog, um, the YouTube channel, uh, Twitter at Serverless Edge and um, podcast. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.